Hello, welcome to Down to Earth with Terry Virch, where we talk about what matters down here on planet Earth. If you love the podcast, please subscribe or give us a rating wherever you're watching this show. Um, today, I am super excited to have Greg Autry, uh, a longtime friend of mine. Greg is a former White House liaison at NASA and a nominee for NASA's chief financial officer. He's currently a clinical professor at the Thunderbird School of Global Management at Arizona State University, where he has a new program in space business. He's also the co-author of Death by China and producer of the film by the same name. He frequently writes for Space News, Forbes, and Foreign Policy. He's founded several tech startups and has just finished a new book entitled The New Entrepreneurial Dynamic. So Greg, welcome on the show. Thank you, Terry. Excited to be here and always pleased to have a conversation with you. Uh, you're a uh... One of uh, America's uh, innovative <laughs> thinkers these days. Well, thank you. It's good to have you on. Where, where are you right now? Are you in LA or Phoenix or where? Uh, I'm in Orange County, California. <laughs> okay. I'm in Yorba Linda. Okay, excellent. The land I, of. I've been hopping back and forth to Phoenix where I've been teaching classes uh, for Thunderbird this fall. Right. Thunderbird's at Arizona State, ASU. Correct. Uh, although the new program I'm launching on uh, commercial space will be in Los Angeles. Oh wow! Okay, yes, that's that is the the hub of. Uh, is are there any commercial? Activity. Are there any space startups out there in Los Angeles? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I, There's well, a small I, one. There's yeah. a small one, yeah. SpaceX. <laughs> oh, I thought you meant relativity space. Yeah. Well, and there's relativity actually. Yeah, there's there's multiple actually relativity and and rocket SpaceX. lab, uh, Virgin Orbit, Galactic, uh, and of course the traditionals, Lockheed, Boeing. Uh, Right. Uh, presence here in Northrop Grumman on scaled composites in Mojave. So right. it's an exciting place to be. Yeah. So it's interesting. The the startup that I'm working with uh, that does space manufacturing, they they made a conscious decision. Where are we going to build our factory? And they looked at LA and they looked at Texas. And I was a big fan of Texas. I was like, hey, come on. We're, we're, Texas is open for business. And California famously is a high cost of living, high tax. They're not exactly the most business friendly place, but you know, the the space industry has flocked there and they seem to be thriving in California. Now, I'm well aware of the problem that California has with business. You know, if, if you lose Oracle, you lose Palantir, uh, you lose Hewlett Packard, right? And then mm -hmm. Tesla and clearly SpaceX is building all their new stuff in Texas and Apple is building their, quote, second headquarters in Austin. Um, you should be concerned, but you know, frankly, most most of my friends in California are in denial about this. They're like blaming the companies or these right. are just aberrations. But but when all your friends leave, it's not them. <laughs> I can so tell. Yeah, I, I'm surprised about your company, but I'm also not surprised because the intensity of the space cluster and the value of being there for a startup and the supply chain and the human resources ability right. uh, is, is super. The quality of our universities in aerospace engineering and other engineering is super. So that doesn't go away. But what's happened is California has become an incubator for companies that start up uh, using California's great resources and then take all their jobs and revenues to Texas. So, uh, you know, uh, eventually we won't reelect the same people, uh, I hope, but uh, it's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, they're like the Kansas City Royals or the Miami Marlins. They're like the the farm team for the Yankees. They develop talent and then they all go to the Yankees. Yeah, so California um, is Texas's farm team. <laughs> I mean, I love California. I'm, I'm in the energy industry right now and, and we're looking at building plants and facilities and deciding where we're going to do that. And uh, California just scares us. Like the, I can't imagine that we would ever voluntarily go there just because of the business environment and so on. But I love it. I, I would love to be out there. Um, I love being in California. But, I've uh, been yeah. everywhere in the world, Terry, and I know you have. And if yeah. I had any choice, I would live in Southern California. The, the climate, the, the diversity of food, cultures, and excitement going on here. It's, yeah. it's a great place to be. But if the government just wasn't trying to, to literally <laughs> kill, kill businesses uh, with regulations and rules, uh, you know, that would make it better. It would make it better. <laughs> so tell me about your time at NASA, Greg. That's when we met. Uh, it was about five years ago. Yeah. So, um, as you may know, I've been studying the commercial space sector uh, for, I believe, longer than anybody is, is a management scholar, um, starting in 2002, and I did the first PhD dissertation on it. So I kind of was oh, really? wow. as, as an expert on the business side of, of space and of this new commercial thing mm -hmm. that's been happening. 
Uh, and then fast forward uh, 2016, uh, presidential election happens. Um, I got a call asking if I wanted to be on the, the presidential transition team, which for folks that don't know, is the group of people that a new administration creates sometime in November, usually after, right after the election, to uh, go into all the agencies, review what they're doing, make recommendations back to the incoming administration so that by January 20th, the new administration has some sense of a policy who they might be appointing into positions that align with, uh, with where they ought to be going. Uh, I was added to the NASA transition team, which I'm also pleased kind of broadly advised uh, on space to the new administration uh, uh, across, across domain. So, you know, we talked to our colleagues on the FAA DOT transition team and, you know, on the DOD and uh, other agencies that <coughs> were concerned with space. So um, that was a amazing experience. I spent all of December and, and January drinking through a fire hose. Um, <laughs> you know, we had a a, a strange little office uh, on the second floor at NASA headquarters that was totally isolated from the rest of the world uh, because they didn't want the political folks from the new administration who weren't yet actual government employees uh, right. interacting with the civil servants. Uh, and then we had an office over at uh, uh, an undisclosed kind of GSA location not far from the White House. And right. that, what was amazing is anything we wanted to know, uh, it was like, my my kid dream because I, I always wanted to be you, Terry. Right? I was going to be <laughs> an astronaut. I didn't get to do that, but I could geek out because you know all these astronauts who were working at NASA in various capacities would come talk to us. Uh, you know, anybody that ran any cool mission uh, at JPL with you know uh, a, a plan to send uh, 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 probes to Europa or uh, or the next uh, you know lander on Mars. Uh, they would come and, and, and brief us. I could talk to any of the Senate directors about any, anything I wanted to know. Um, all of the leaders from all the top space companies came in to talk to us. Troy Bruner from ULA came and gave us some amazing insights. Um, you know, folks from SpaceX, Jeff Bezos came. <laughs> you know, it was it was it was a total geek out. So that was amazing. <laughs> I I loved it. We took the job very seriously though, uh, and I worked with the a great group of professionals. Uh, sometimes we disagreed within ourselves about what direction things right. should go, but uh, that was a great dynamic. And I appreciate that the fact that there were people appointed to the team that had different policy perspectives. Um, so I love that. As, as you know, we came up with some recommendations that that really did kind of change the direction of where, where NASA and broadly uh, the American space policy is gone. Right. So I, I want to make a point here and to get my politics out right up front. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. And for most things, I probably fall in the middle. I'm a, I'm a pretty moderate guy. But, um, you know, if people worked for Obama, they're evil. Or if you worked in the Trump administration, you're tr evil. You're trying to destroy democracy. And we've gotten this like hate works really well and hate sells really well. And, and the polarization obviously has gotten divided. But the reality is there's a lot of people in government that just want to do the right thing. Um, and you you kind of went through that. You were nominated to be the chief financial officer and our dysfunctional political system would rather just not get appointees, be they judges, be they whatever government positions, you know, um, talk, talk about that a little bit. What was that like? Uh, I'm sure just because you were working in the quote unquote Trump administration, people must have like you you probably got a lot of funny looks i would guess yeah there's a lot to to put your head around there so the yeah. first thing i want to say is thank god um space is generally not a partisan domain uh, right there are people always trying to make it one uh with right. various angles that they want to leverage but the people inside the space community are generally great people and as you noted 90 plus percent of the people who are doing the work in government whether they're political appointees or civil servants are really there to do to do the best job for America and, and sometimes right. more broadly for for humankind uh, right. and Na NASA they really believe that uh, and and obviously there's a whole lot of smart people there so I, I have the hugest respect for for people doing the job there and and everybody on our team did when we came in and we were treated very warmly not only by the civil servants but by the outgoing uh, you know Obama uh, political team and and. You know, I, I knew Charlie Bolden before that, and, and I know other people that 
that served on that that team uh well david radzanowski i consider a good friend of mine he was the cfo under the obama team and he wrote a, a really nice letter of support for me for my nomination for cfo so there's no remember animosity. that there's no animosity there that, <laughs> right, that, that, right, that you right. might see in the political domain but as you said you go out to the public and you know you say i'm with administration x and you know this is somebody who supports uh supports why and uh you know they instantly judge you right and you know i think that's something we've got to get out of in our, our society there are on the transition team for instance literally a thousand people uh and there were some criticisms of that transition team michael lewis i think wrote a book called the fifth risk which uh was brutal on i think that the department of energy's transition team um but i can tell you the group i was in really smart people. Again, we didn't always agree. A lot of them had what I would call a more traditional space approach. And I was viewed as having a more commercial uh, space right. approach. And, uh, you know, uh, I was the commercial crew guy and they were the SLS Orion folks. That said, uh, we, came, we came to terms and realized what could be done uh, within the Venn diagram of technology, economics, and politics, where those things come together in the circle are things that can actually happen, right? And if you don't realize that, if you're the engineer that insists on something that can't be done economically, you're doomed. If you're the political person that insists on doing something that can't be done technically, uh, you know, that's not happening either. And, and so uh, everybody else has to realize their political constraints too. So we did, we came together, uh, it worked. Um, I have to say when I went through the CFO nomination process, Terry, that was really interesting because I had the opportunity or, or had to, uh, first of all, have my life just disassembled, right? So you got the FBI background investigation, literally guys in suits walking around my neighborhood, knocking on the door, talking to the neighbors. Do you know these people? Uh, I can't tell you why we're asking, but do they represent a threat to US national security? <laughs> do, you, do you believe they might be members of any terrorist organization? Yeah, that's interesting, right? Uh, take your finances, it's like an IRS audit time three um and you've got the office of governmental ethics the senate themselves has a background uh check you've got the nasa general counsel uh to account to and they all have different agendas of making sure that whatever candidate they have is not going to be a problem uh i was impressed by that honestly anybody that gets through a senate confirmed presidential appointment uh uh bless them uh uh it, you know i i for instance i sold every stock i owned and like March of, of 2021 or 2020, when this became apparent that I was gonna I have this happen to me. And I, I quit my job in August to work full time on, on this issue. So, I mean, literally this cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to, uh, uh, to attempt to do. Uh, but the good thing was I, I, I went and I met with the senators uh, on the committee, uh, you know, both Ms and, and Republicans and, and with their staff, good people mostly. Uh, and mostly people that cared about making sure we did the right thing at NASA and that uh, NASA's great legacy was was brought forward uh, and, and we'd have very solid conversations. Fast forward, as you know, uh, my nomination didn't actually hit the Senate till July 27th because all this background check stuff and COVID took a whole lot longer than it should have, but you know, nobody knew how to deal with that. The Senate goes out on recess. I quit my job at University of Southern California expecting no problem. When I come back in September, I'll be approved on unanimous consent, which is where there's no objections because I don't see myself as a contentious candidate. The previous two CFOs had been approved on UC, including Jeff DeWitt, who served uh, for three years, who was treasurer of Arizona and uh, a kind of uh, campaign supporter for Trump. So if, if no Democrat objected to him, how could they object to a professor from USC, right? And you're, you're not Michael Flynn. Right. No, everything looked good. Uh, then, right. unfortunately, we lost uh, Justice Ginsburg at the beginning of September. So my nomination hearing possibilities got pushed back uh, while the Senate battled over SCOTUS and it became a very toxic environment. It wasn't certainly <laughs> wasn't great right before that. We yeah. had impeachment and all that. Right. It, just, it became intractable. Right. Uh, then my nomination uh, uh, hearing comes up a few days after the uh, the election, right? And, and right. Just, I don't even need to describe that environment, right? You yeah, know, right. Walking to the Senate like four days after that, uh, it was not good. Uh, the order came down on, on the Democratic side to vote against everything that Trump did, no matter what. Um, right. That included me. Uh, but I right. passed the committee on party line. It would not right. have happened if it wasn't for, for the election and for the SCOTUS, but right. that's what happened. It wasn't about me. And, and I can right. tell you privately, Democratic staff members told me, we're sorry, it's not about you, but this is right. it. Right. Uh, and then a vote was never held because Mitch McConnell, who uh, 
who still could have put me through on a party line right. vote, I would have cleared, wouldn't do it because he wanted to spend every minute getting judges uh, and he didn't want to spend any floor time on NASA CFO. So right. there we go. <laughs> what a, and so to, I, I wanted you to tell that story just for our listeners to understand, you know, somebody who's going to serve in the government, they have a life, they live in California, not Washington. You know, they have, you're not like a billionaire, but you have stocks and you have a financial system that you had to uphold. This costs you hundreds of thousands of dollars. I don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars to lose personally. And my wife doesn't never, think we do, but <laughs> I know, I know. And then and I ended up in unemployed in January, right? And I was concerned because you, you're I'm unemployed. unemployed. You quit your job and you're unemployed yeah. to serve to serve the com- the country in a lower paying job where you have to move to DC, which is super expensive and not a great place to live, frankly. Um, that's amazing. What and you're one of thousands of people who have to go through this, you know. Exactly. But I do have to say that, you know, there aren't enough people on transition teams who don't come from D.C. for that reason, because the transition team service is completely unpaid, right? Right. So that cost me, I figured, about $20,000. I had to move to D.C. on my own dime and live there for two months. Uh, Luckily, I was a college professor, so I basically had the month of December off, although it was grading at night, what have you. Right. but for most people, that's just impossible. And so we don't get the people we should get uh, in, into government service because of, of that situation. And the yeah, transition I, team in particular, I believe there should be a way to, uh, to pay those people uh, so that we can get them uh, from a deeper and, and broader segment of American society. Right. I went to, um, when I went to business school, one of my living group members was from Singapore. And I remember she told us that they actually pay their president, like a CEO, they pay their top government people like equivalent, you know, so that, so it's not, you know, you don't have to be a independently wealthy just to take a government job. Um, uh, It's, it, I think they get a lot, their, their efficiency. I don't know what kind of KPIs or, you know, key performance indicators they have, but I, I have a feeling their government probably works a lot better when they run it like a business. So anyway, it works a lot better economically yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, right. And you know, I've got to say, I've got a lot of good friends uh, on both the left and the right. And the first thing they would love to do is cut Congress's salary. That's going to show them, right? Because they're not good. <laughs> and, you know, they don't realize those folks don't make enough money. Uh, I was good friends with a couple of congressmen, uh, Congressman yeah. Mark Ticano, um, I went to high school with a, a, a progressive uh, Democrat who's openly gay, Congressman Dana Rohrabacher and I were really good friends for, for many years as South County's a very conservative uh, Republican member of Congress. But neither of them is well paid enough. Uh, Congressman Rohrabacher slept on his his couch in his office, as do a lot of uh, of uh, U.S. congressmen, because they can't afford to keep a home in their district uh, with their family and and get uh, even a decent apartment in, in Washington D.C. So yeah. I would go to the, the Rayburn Building and go in the elevator, and there would be with Dana Rohrabacher with with his hands full of his laundry, going out to uh, uh, to, to do his his laundry and then back to right. his office. Right, he should be doing the people's business. Uh, and right. Something. Cutting their salary is not the answer. If, if, if you want a job done well, you pay good people to do it well. And if they're not doing it well, you get new people, right? <laughs> right. That's, it's kind of a basic uh, no brainer. Yeah. I think there's 30 or 40 congressmen and I, people ask me all this all the time. Why don't you run for Congress? Why don't you run for the Senate? And I, I mean, one of the reasons is I can't afford to, I, I'm not, I'm just a middle-class guy. I live in the suburbs of Houston in a sea of middle-class houses um but there, i i couldn't afford to have a house in washington and, and what i have now with with kids in college so it's an, i think that's a real issue that people don't normally talk and you know most americans don't want to hear it you know congressman's making 150 or 160 or whatever thousand dollars it sounds like a lot but there's so many restrictions on them you know that they can't it, 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 it can be financially tough for some folks, for sure. No, and you certainly can't afford to keep two households. And then you're on a, a, a plane, particularly if you live in the West Coast, or right. gosh forbid you're from Hawaii. Yeah. You know, uh, the amount yeah, of no kidding. And going back and forth, because you have to go back to your district to visit your constituents. It's, it, it's it a tough, brutal. it's a tough thing. So um, bef- before you went to NASA, you were a businessman or a professor? What, like, what kind of startups have you worked on? What did you do before? So um, I was actually a, uh, a, a teenage startup uh, uh, founder. Ah, um, cool. I started a video game company in, 
in fact, I'll, I'm going to show you a slide if I can real quick. I know everybody sure. can't see this, but uh, for anybody that's watching the podcast, let me see if this system will let me share this. Um, we'll describe it. Yeah. Oops, there we go. So uh, that is me at age 18. Uh, oh my gosh. On the right there. Uh, with, That's with amazing. Hair. Okay. So yeah, I had uh, the long shaggy haircut. Uh, and uh, as anybody who knows me now that I certainly I have, I look more like uh, Steve Jobs right before he died. And uh, I, used to look <laughs> like, I used to look like uh, Steve Jobs, the young entrepreneur. And the exciting I, thing I, was I, I had a, a, a software company that, that I started in high school and we made software for the Apple II computer. I had that computer that I took that to the Air Force Academy. I was like one of the only guys with a computer. Uh, I used to play Wolfenstein on that on the Apple go. too. Yeah, you look like I bet I just watched The Dirt, which is a show about Motley Crue. You could have been a you could have been in Motley Crue, man. I would have wanted to be in Motley. Crue. <laughs> we, we were a bunch of heavy metal uh, headbangers there. And, yeah, uh, as you can see uh, from the picture that you know, computers hooked up to the TV, which we yeah. used to do because you couldn't afford an actual dedicated monitor. Uh, yep. um, we made a game that looked a lot like uh, like an arcade game, Pac-Man, mm -hmm. um, because at that time there was no copyright that allowed you to protect the quote, look and feel of a program. You could only copyright the source code for a program. Right. So if I, as a programmer, had never seen the source code for Pac-Man and made a game that looked exactly like Pac-Man, as long <laughs> as I did copy their code, that was good to go legally. Uh, and there was no home version for these games, so there was there was demand. Uh, so right. my friends and I wrote Pac-Man. Basically, we called it Taxman uh, <laughs> in, in, in high school. Uh, hang on, just a sec. It came in a, a package like this on a, a five and a quarter inch disc. Uh, oh my, my god, color, that's awesome! Printed. And when I got to college as an undergrad, um, you know, we spent all night uh, with two computers copying discs and, uh, and sticking them in these packages. I lived in a 19 foot travel trailer uh, for kids that couldn't afford dorms because my family was was not well off. I was a first generation college student. And, right. Uh, there were what school were you at? Dog, three of us and a dog in a trailer the size of the, the office I have now. What, what uh, school? Uh, University of California, Irvine. Uh, OK. A, a computer science major. Um, Man. And in the morning, I would pile them into my 68 Ford Falcon and drive around Southern California's uh, booming uh, strip mall computer store world uh, and stop mm -hmm. at these little stores and, and, and sell them games. Uh, suddenly, I was making more money than my parents. Um, and I kept registering for classes, but I didn't go. So I, I love telling my students, I left UC Irvine as an undergrad with a 0 0.875 GPA. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Autry had a 0 0.875 GPA. You're you're like Bill Gates or uh or Steve Jobs. Except I went back and they didn't, right? They just dropped. Yeah. Out. Well, they uh, get they I, got dog, they got billions, honorary doctors. If I'd made billions, then then I wouldn't have gone back to school. Probably. Right, exactly. I, I loved school, right? So because I, I registered yeah. for 24 units. It didn't take it didn't go to any classes. So that really oh my God. waxed your GPA pretty quick. Um, but the interesting thing about that was if I understood business, right? How business worked, I would in fact, I, I am convinced be a billionaire because we were one of the first about 10 uh, personal computer game companies in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. We had the talent and and the, the first mover advantage, but I didn't know what an angel investor was. I didn't know what a venture capitalist was. I'd never heard that word uh, because I came from a, uh, a family of very small business people who ran very local, uh, you know, the, regional style. The uh, family operation. business, right. I knew nothing about scaling. Um, but the funny thing that happened at this computer show here, which was in San Francisco, I believe, um, Nolan Bushnell, uh, who owned Atari, had purchased the rights to Pac-Man from the Japanese company Namco and decided, hey, I'm going to go out and uh, uh, enforce the idea of look and feel, meaning nobody else can make a program that looks like Pac-Man on home computers because I have the license rights to it. And we were going to be the uh, the case study, basically, uh, the legal precedent. Uh, and so these lawyers show up uh, and hand me a cease and desist order. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, what's a cease and desist order? Right? <laughs> and we would have been doomed. I mean, they would have just shut us down because clearly they had the legal weight and, and perhaps right. the, the moral right. Um, right. If it wasn't for the oddest thing, a guy named Jerry Parnell. Do you know Jerry? Uh-uh. 
Jerry was a famous science fiction writer at the time, um, and he was also the uh, top computer industry journalist at the time. He wrote for a magazine called Byte Magazine, which was yeah. I don't know, like the Ars Technica or Wired of its day. It was right. all the words around. He wrote an article in Byte um, with the subtitle, Atari Leans on Entrepreneurial Teams. Um, and and made us look like little uh, you know entrepreneurial heroes being attacked by the big bad guys. Uh, and the next thing I know, my phone rings and it's it's the Atari lawyers, and they're like, "We didn't mean to say we were going to sue you. I mean, we wanted to buy you, right?" And so uh, suddenly, my my product becomes the official Apple Pac-Man on on the Apple II, and we get paid instead of sued. So uh, that was a good day. Oh my gosh! Wow. Yeah. So you, That's how old were you then? That's my story there, but because we didn't understand how to scale our business or attract capital, uh, we were washed out quickly when the music and publishing industries delved into the game industry in the early 80s and it, it exploded um, and learned my lesson, which is one of the reasons I later went back to school to do an MBA. So you sold it. It sounds like you got probably an okay pile of cash. It not- wasn't smart enough to get the okay pile of cash. We got that, that, that sub... <laughs> minimal pile of cash but the, yeah. the drinking money pile of cash <laughs> there we go yeah ca- ca- cars and <laughs> right <laughs> <Fun>. <laughs> uh, well that's um man that is an amazing that's an amazing story greg i never knew this i'll well, we'll go back to the normal view if we can um yeah oh yeah let me end my share Thank you. yeah and so a- after that i i had a series of tech startups a computer break and fix company which i i sold to a large nationwide company in texas uh, called CompuCom, and i managed their operations yeah. for a few years i started a networking and application development company and we made enterprise software for kaiser permanente uh oh wow hmo for many years so i made software that handled uh, all of their prescription refill systems uh and their communications between uh the members and and the, and the doctors and uh, the passing of those communications on a kind of early email type system within the uh, the clinic, um, and that business did really 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 well. Uh, I started a company that that did digital photography for the e commerce business, taking uh, pictures of the products that the e commerce folks had to sell because they didn't have JPEGs and GIFs for those, uh, and they didn't have the textual data, the descriptions and the ingredients and stuff. So uh, I had typist to enter in all that information and we would sell the database basically to an e-commerce company of here's a box of Tide with its picture and the description and you know the, the right. safety warnings <laughs> and uh, anyway a, a series of those sort of sort of businesses uh, and then I along the way completed my undergrad after 13 years of night school <laughs> oh which is in history by the way and uh, uh, I have 72 units of computer science but the degrees in history and so you then majored in history wow yeah. People say to me, what do you do with a history degree? And, and you know what the answer to that is, Terry? Nothing, or I don't know. What is Jeopardy? <laughs> so so you... anyway, uh, I then did my MBA. UC Irvine asked me yeah. to stay and, uh, and teach uh, entrepreneurship after that, which, which I enjoyed. Uh, and I kind of dedicated myself. I'm going to make sure no young entrepreneurs fail to... Uh, to grab the opportunities that I had. And so that's one of the reasons I've, I've stayed a business professor is to, to try to help uh, those folks make the right decisions and, and get where they their talent uh, talent will take them. And I've loved doing that. Um, yes. So so are you, you're just a professor now or do you have any companies that you're running? Um, I'm actually engaged in a, a really cool company and hold on, I'll show you something. <laughs> For those who can't see, we're, we're getting the show and tell here from Greg. Pictures right. of pictures of Apple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I know what you're talking about. I've, I've helped these guys too. Yeah, so... Um, it's a skateboard. We're looking at a composite skateboard. Yeah, uh, so I had a student at, at USC that came to me uh, from the Rocket Propulsion Lab and a really amazing group uh, of uh, undergrad students who build their own rockets at uh, USC uh, who sent the first uh, student-built uh, rocket to space a couple of years ago. And he had built a skateboard out of the leftover scrap composite uh, carbon fiber in the lab. And I'm like, wow, I know some companies that uh, that have a whole lot of scrap carbon fiber here in Southern California. Um, and those companies, unfortunately, won't let us say who they are, but you might guess who they are. Right. Um, I, I, I went to the heads of those those companies and and. They were throwing this stuff out, right? So right. carbon fiber comes on a big bolt and right. you cut out the pieces you need 
and and you throw away 40 percent of it 20 percent mm -hmm. of it some significant amounts like you cut a t-shirt out of a bolt of fabric that that negative space the trim scrap goes away right uh they were happy to uh to to give that to somebody who would reuse it uh for right. a, a token token fee and so uh we've been collecting that material uh i put the first amount of money into that business. And it was really a case where often I just advise a student and make connections for them. But in this case, <clears throat> A, he needed the money. B, he needed somebody credible to go negotiate. Right. The other. He could not have gone to um, super well-known space entrepreneur acts right. and, uh, and right. made that deal, right? I could, <laughs> uh, and you know, uh, you need that credibility because one of the things is this material is res restricted on the State Department's munitions list often. Uh, mm -hmm. It can't leave the country until it's turned into a, a product, right? Because right. that raw material could be turned into a missile or something. Uh, so they're responsible for the custody of that. And then, you know, uh, so anyway, uh, the company Elevated Materials mm -hmm. um, makes a whole lot of different products now uh, frames for drones, uh, arms for robots, uh, uh, plates for. Uh, for portable x-ray uh, systems mm -hmm. for, for COVID diagnosis and a lot of things along with the 121C uh, skateboard brand. Which, <laughs> so uh, I am uh, a shareholder and member of the board of directors in that and, and advisor to the company. And that's uh, an and amazing several, company. Several other space companies. Uh, I'm excited to be on the board of uh, Interstellar Lab run by Barbara Belbisi. If you look that up, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, we're building... Uh, Habitats uh, here on Earth that uh, will accommodate uh, uh, high-end plant growth for like the perfume industry or the, the spice industry, uh, mm -hmm. but that are translatable to uh, lunar and Mars uh, habitats. So we're trying to improve the ECLIS uh, that I know you went through heck with uh, yourself. Uh, uh, your book talked uh, repeatedly mm -hmm. about the, uh, the frustration with the carbon scrubbers. Um, yeah. And so developing new technologies like that on Earth to maintain uh, uh, specific atmospheric environments is both a business and a solution for for making space better. Hmm. Very cool. There's a lot of really interesting people, and um, I'm going to have a, a startup on the podcast soon with some SpaceX alum that are doing space manufacturing. You know, ma manufacturing things in zero G, and that's something that really hasn't happened yet. You know, the ISS is where you do science and science experiments and let's see if this works, but it's that it's absolutely not a manufacturing place. And I think when, once we manufacture, that'll really realize the potential that space has. I couldn't agree more. Um, and there's a lot of great companies in that space. I've been a fan of made in space slash yep. red wire for years. And there's uh, there's new companies, as you noted, um, yeah. that are thinking about building, structures and things for use in space as well as high-end materials that we'll be able to return to earth but you know that's where we'll get the value uh for mm -hmm. our planet and for the future of humanity is is when we can actually make things that uh, that are useful i think the the company called made in space they sent up a 3d printer when i was there on my on my last flight and uh i think we did the first 3d printing in space like we made a wrench yeah, but it was plastic, so you can't really turn metal bolts with a plastic wrench very well. Um, but the the point was, we demonstrated that you could three D print, and so that that was pretty cool. And we can three D print metal, but you know that's another step. And speaking of that, another right. company that I was excited to give a small amount of mentoring to was Relativity Space. Yeah, out of USC, another great California startup that uh, Tim Ellis, right? Yeah, Tim Ellis and Jordan Noon. Um, 3D printing uh, full rockets. Uh, yeah. Got an amazing facility in Long Beach. They're about ready to open another California facility. They've got a huge uh, test stand and uh, and uh, assembly site in Stennis. Uh, mm -hmm. And they've got uh, launch pads over on the uh, the Space Force site at uh, Delta 45 in Florida and uh, and at Vandy here in California. So exciting. T Tim's an amazing guy. I actually wrote, he was nominated to be Time Magazine's top 100, you know, business people or young, whatever. He was in time this list of a hundred people. And I wrote the blurb for that, like the, 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 for Tim. So that oh, he's, awesome. he's cool. No, he, he sure is. I just did a, a long interview with him. Uh, that's going to be in my, my new entrepreneurship textbook. Actually. Oh, cool. Well, yeah, let's talk about that. So you've had, you have this front row seat to tech companies um, and you have for your whole life and you quit your job at USC. <laughs> so what, what happened after that, after the, 
after your experience with America's, uh, you know, innovative and slick and streamlined political process, um, you came back to doing what? Can you talk about what you're doing now? Yeah, absolutely. So in January, I wasn't sure where I was going to go. Um, I had several uh, great universities that I'd been working with uh, who were interested in space management and began to see there's a need there for that because we've been focusing on the STEM career thing for a long time. So we understand how to bring more engineers into the mix and in particular, a much more diverse set of engineers. We're getting a lot of great women engineers, for instance, but nobody was doing anything about managers. And so space startups were having trouble because they would either get engineers and scientists moved up, and this is both startups and honestly government agencies, scientists moved into managing a giant multi-billion dollar space project, uh, and they don't have accounting skills, finance skills, leadership right. skills, anything you get when you go to an MBA, for instance. Right. Right? Um, and the traditional MBA isn't good uh, for startups. That's something that a lot of folks have known for a long time because it, it it's really designed for large corporations. So what we really need is is a master's degree for, for people starting new projects, either internally at companies or starting new companies in the space industry. So you get Silicon Valley folks or Wall Street folks coming in. Oh, I can manage a space company because look, I started an app, you know, uh, but <laughs> they don't understand what an orbital inclination is. They don't understand right. what Delta V is and right. what well, you can't go from here to that satellite can't hover over this space, right. take photos, whatever. Right. They don't know the rocket equation. So we're, somebody needed to solve that problem. So I, I, I worked with Oxford. I, I worked closely with uh, Embry-Riddle Worldwide, uh, talked to University of Texas. All of them had, I think, really good uh, uh, intentions of, of kind of moving into this space, literally. Uh, but uh, my good friend, Alan Stern, do you know Alan? Uh, I, d- I just know, I have his book about New Horizons, but I, okay. I know his name only. Those that don't know, he's the PI on New Horizons, the, the mission to Pluto, and a really disruptive force in the in the uh, right. and uh, space sciences community. He really right. did something amazing with that project, and it's worth reading his book to see the efforts that he went through, not just about the science and technology, but the, the politics uh, right. and bureaucracy, right? Um, but he and I are good friends, and he connected me with Lindy Elkins Tanton at uh, Arizona State University, who's running a great uh, initiative called the Interplanetary Initiative there. Uh, and uh, we started talking, and ASU broadly is interested in the, across the enterprise uh, space applications, and so they've got a new space initiative run by Jim Bell from uh, JPL, who is also uh, uh, the president or was the president of the Planetary Society, uh-huh. um, and they've hired a number of, of brilliant people, uh, Timmy Aganaba in the, uh, in the law school, uh, just really good space people, so um, they were happy to add me to that uh, that group, and I'm in the Thunderbird School of Global Management uh, at ASU, which is an amazing place. Are, are you familiar with Thunderbird's history? I'm not. I, I went to pilot training at Williams, and uh, my wife went to ASU, so I I know the school. It's a, I love the school. It's beautiful. It's a cool campus, but uh, not Thunderbird. So Thunderbird, interesting, is was a private institution until ASU bought it a few years ago. Oh, um, wow. Okay. Like, in 1946, by a group of Army Air Corps officers uh, who thought, coming back from World War II, that the 20th century would be about globalization and that the United States needed a school to train American business leaders uh, in global thinking uh, and, and how to work in the international domain. So they, they founded the first, uh, basically, school of international trade and, and, and leadership. Uh, wow, and in Phoenix. They, well, actually, in Glendale at a uh, uh, Air Force training base called uh, Thunderbird Field, and they 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 were basically given Thunderbird Field, and, and the business or the school was there for many many years. Uh, anyway, ASU wow. has integrated it. Uh, yeah. I'm excited to be there. Uh, it's always been uh, viewed as a world leader in in uh, international management training, and mm-hmm. uh, now with ASU's uh, uh, amazing uh, resources and and Michael Crow, the president of ASU's dynamic vision uh, i'm excited to be there and uh, our dean uh sanjeev kagram at thunderbird uh amazingly focused on on the fourth industrial revolution and how technology can make all our lives better uh and right. so we're launching a new space program it's going to be in la actually in the, in the hub of the commercial uh space community and uh that is what i am working on now we launch in january if anybody's interested uh, in applying, uh, please uh, just Google Thunderbird School of Global Management and you'll find the space degree program there and fill out the more information. We would uh, love to consider you. It's a one-year executive program. 
Okay. So you'll be out uh, at the end of 2022. Um, you're going to do a, a week boot camp, a week at Kennedy Space Center in the summer, where hopefully we're going to see the Falcon Heavy launch of Wendy Elkin Captain Psyche probe, uh, and then um, a, a week at the end. And in between, it's one weekend online and one weekend uh, uh, in person. Um, so it's not a it's not a heavy lift commitment. It's designed for busy executives. And, uh, That's amazing. So this the, there was a space startup that asked me if to as an advisor and so on, and they had a CEO. And um, as you mentioned, she, she didn't understand the difference between Leo and Geo. And yeah. like we had some meetings yeah. with some, there was some fundamental lack of understanding of things. And that's the kind of thing that, yeah. I mean, yeah. M- money's money, cash flow's cash flow, but it space is its own unique thing. So I can totally see where you're coming from. Yeah, uh, we'd love to have her yeah. or those engineers who are right. suddenly moved up into management and uh, right. we can train them as they go. That sounds that sounds like an amazing program. Well, congrats on that. I'm sorry you had to quit your old job at USC, which is pretty cool, by the way. I, I remember it's meeting great, you there. Yeah, but yeah, a great a great school. But actually, I'm much more excited about the overall interest in, in space and the dynamism right. they issue. It's it's like nothing I've ever seen. So, uh, um, one of the thing, another thing I want to talk to you about, Greg, is China, and you co-authored a book. You you're off your co-author has a pretty interesting story. Um, he's not necessarily a, a church mouse, quiet, sh- wilting flower kind of guy. <laughs> Can you talk, talk about, talk about that? You know who, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, well, for sure. Book. So, um, you know, I, I'm going to tell everybody, when you're doing your PhD, it's not easy to do it. <laughs> one thing you don't want to do while you're doing your dissertation is also write a popular press book and make a documentary film. Uh, <laughs> but I did that. Uh, and and right. it was exciting. So um, I, I taught as an adjunct at, at UC Irvine's uh, Mirage School of, of Business, which another institution I, I love for several years. They convinced me to go back and, and get my PhD and, uh, and become serious as opposed to just an adjunct professor. Right. Uh, I went ahead and, and decided to do that in 2008. Uh, Marguerite Wersema, who was the head of the, the strategy uh, group within the business school, um, I thought was going to be my advisor and it would work, work out well because it aligned with my particular interest in, uh, in entrepreneurship and startups. She got the opportunity to go uh, to Rice for, for a couple mm-hmm. of years uh, and, and she did. So she was in Houston with you, but all of a sudden mm-hmm. I didn't have an advisor. Uh, Professor Peter Navarra, who taught economics at, uh, at Mirage, uh, stepped up and, and, and said he would, he would take me on. And I wasn't exactly what every uh, professor is looking for, because I was a <laughs> second career uh, PhD right. in my 40s, right? right? And they want to, most of them want a, a young 20 something year old who will wash their car and, uh, right. <laughs> and, and, and do all their work for them and let, <laughs> let them put their name on the work. Right. Um, and, and uh, you know, Peter was going to basically uh, give me a little more free reign, which, which was right. great to do what I wanted. Right. But I was right. interested in his work, which was policy and, and macroeconomics. Now, what's interesting is, is Peter was a good Democrat, and I was generally a, a, what I would call a moderate Republican. Right. Um, and uh, Peter had run for uh, uh, for Congress and for uh, for for mayor of San Diego as, as a Democrat a couple of times with the support of Bill Clinton and uh, Al Gore, in fact. Wow. Um, I had no idea he was a Democrat. I thought exactly the opposite. Anyway. Yeah. No, um, but what I'm going to, you know, get to is that, that he was always a, a really open-minded individual uh, right. uh, uh, and disruptive thinker. Yeah, um, for sure. So anyway, that said, uh, we shared a particular concern, which was the threat that the Chinese Communist Party uh, seemed to be uh, holding uh, to what we felt was the whole future of humanity. And this is very a, a broad concern. Uh, we were concerned about the human rights issues we saw going on with we had friends in the, the Falun Gong or, or the Tibetan movement who, uh, you know, were basically seeing a genocide against their people being conducted uh, by a country that the United States was nominally very supportive of, you know, that the president of China would get hosted to a state dinner and there'd be these poor Tibetans outside the White House saying, <laughs> what, about, what about us? You know, we're literally being, yeah. being killed and uh, our, our land taken. And, 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 and what year, and, what year was this? Um, 2006, 2008, eight or nine. And yeah. Peter and I had written a, a, an editorial together on, uh, on, uh, 
on space in China. Um, right. Uh, because I, I think I came to his attention when I wrote a piece uh, about space in China following their ASAT test in 2007, right? Yeah. So anyway, fast forward, environmental concerns. Uh, frankly, China says a lot of green things. They love issuing propaganda about that, but it's the worst environment you've ever seen. It's like, you know, you've been to Beijing, I assume. I've, I, ha I use a picture of Northeastern China as my, you know, the environment's in trouble picture uh, when I do speaking, yeah. Yeah, the, the, Beijing, it's it's yellow. It looks like you're landing in Mars. It's so yellow outside the yeah, the, I, the pollution. Every time China announces their new green initiative, and the Europeans and, and progressive Americans pile on board, I'm like, it's like me going to my teenage son and saying, uh, you know, what's up? And he's like, I'm going to clean the house. And I'm like, let's look at your room first. Right. 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 <laughs> right. 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 You get your room straight. I'll let you touch the house. But <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> anyway. Um, so that problem of uh, military aggression, uh, they were already drawing a red line around the South China Sea. Uh, yeah. They've been constantly fighting with all of their neighbors, Vietnam, India, uh, Japan, uh, the Philippines, uh, you know, when again, when all of your neighbors have a problem with you, it's probably not the neighbors. Right. Right. So that concerned us. Uh, and America's dysfunctional trade relationship was just killing jobs in the U.S. And we saw all of these blue collar workers in, in the Rust Belt, uh, you know, ending up unemployed at age 50. And I can tell you from my experience last yeah. year, you don't want to be an unemployed 50 something year old. It's, it's, a, it's a scary <laughs> feeling because I, I know some of those folks, they never got, got back, back on their feet. Right, I know. Uh, and you know, our society has just, just been stupid. It's like telling me an auto worker who's 55 and been building batteries for Delco or whatever, oh, it's your fault because you didn't keep your skills up. You need to go back to school and become a computer programmer and compete with a bunch of 18 year olds. It's just- right just insulting and, uh, and demeaning. It is. And, and when you say that, you end up with what we just saw for the last four exactly. years. I, I honestly, I mean, I, while I was writing this book, I went and walked the halls of Congress talking about two things, my love for commercial space and the future that could do for us in the US and my concern about China. And I would say to the Democrats, you need to do something because you're supposed to support labor, but you're not doing it. You're throwing them under the bus, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and most of the Dems were embracing the whole globalist paradigm. Right. The, the, retra the, the retraining nonsense. The liberal then, elites, you know, the, uh, yeah, anyway. I'm and I would you. tell the Republicans, same thing, you know, you, you can't uh, embrace corporate American Wall Street uh, funding this thing because you're going to have these angry people up in the Rust Belt, right? And, and you're going to have January 6th, yeah. They're going to come get you guys. Yeah. And I said, you're going to either have a, uh, you know, an autocrat on the left or the right that you're not going to like that's going to rise up. It's either Hugo right. Chavez or uh, or Mussolini, uh, and 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 that's right. going to happen if you don't uh, address this problem. And they chose not to address that problem. So anyway, we <laughs> yeah. wrote this book called Death by China, uh, addressing this issue broadly. Uh, yeah. Made a film. It's on Amazon Prime now. If you'd uh, like to see it, narrated by Martin Sheen. I'm I'm taking my uh, notes here. I'm going to watch that film tonight. I'll watch it. And, and fast forward, of course, as, as you know, uh, Professor Navarro ended up joining uh, the Trump campaign when when Trump started addressing these issues, uh, and he's been a uh, a, a strong supporter uh, ever since. Which coincidentally had nothing to do with me getting the uh, the uh, NASA transition team appointment. That totally came through my connections in the commercial space industry and the fact that people here in California wanted somebody added to the team who represented commercial space uh, right. because the initial team was all very traditional. But, uh, yeah. So, but, well, that's um, the the China thing for me personally, and I. I had a chance, you know, in my post astronaut career, I've been speaking. I had a chance in 2018 to go to China five times. I met a lot of great Chinese friends. Um, love going to the country. It's the most amazing place. Americans don't understand it at all. It's such a, it's not China. It's like saying there's America. Well, there's so many different aspects exactly. of not America. You know, well, foreign, foreign friends have been to Orlando and they say right. it's America. It's like Right. I <laughs> well, that's like saying, well, America's sunny or America's rainy or whatever. Well, America's like a whole continent, right? And China okay. is even more so. And uh, so we don't understand it, but it, it's an amazing place. And I don't know that I can ever go back because I've I've said some pretty critical things. And a, a good friend of mine, a lady named Cheng Lei, I'll put in a plug for her again, was a journalist. She actually interviewed me several times on CG, CGTN, which is the Chinese um, and I think it's the world's largest English language uh, media company. Isn't that ironic? It's a 
and and they arrested her, accused her of being a spy. She she has an Australian passport. She's Chinese, but Australian citizen. And as part of their spat with Australia, they just arrested her like something out of 1984. And I don't know when we're going to see her again. The BBC has done some stories about her, but um, that's not a good sign. Like our freedom of press in the First Amendment is an important freedom that Ch China doesn't have any there's no rights or freedoms for anybody. It's just whatever the government decides to let them do is what the government is, what the rights they have. And if you're not aware, I just saw a story yesterday. There's, there's a new piece of legislation working its way through China, which has the blessing yeah. of Xi. And so it will happen because I wonder if it'll pass. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, anyway, it is going to outlaw all non-state media. And so it looks like they're going to shut down uh, several you know, reasonably decent, uh, operations, right. probably, uh, uh, South China morning press and, and, uh, Shishang and some other, uh, other semi-independent, uh, media sources and, and just have the state stuff. And, and they may in fact expel, uh, all the Western reporters. I don't know, but, uh, uh they are that's a dangerous job. I, I can tell you my reporter friends in jail, there's a lot of reporters in jail no, in no, China. No. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not a safe, thing and so now, my I respect is of yeah. course not to go back and i suspect that I'm, i if they're smart i'm on there they do not uh, uh, do not uh, uh, but. <laughs> i'm i'm sure they are so for the chinese government watching the podcast hello ni hao but uh <laughs> this is it, it's not good what's happening i had um two guys on i met it they were students in the class i teach at harvard business school and um they the one guy, Kuzat Altai, uh, check out the podcast. It's an amazing story. I was literally crying listening to his story. The first 30 minutes is incredible. He was He's a Uyghur, and uh, he had to escape from China, spent a couple years in Turkey as a UN HCR refugee, made it to the States with his wife and baby, working. He, he, was, he hated being on welfare, so he went to the mall to get a minimum wage job. And eventually, somebody was making $90,000 a year coding. So he taught himself how to write code. And now he has this global company with a couple thousand students teaching basically people like him. He, he targets like lower class, uneducated people to teach them how to code and, and make something out of their lives. It's an incredible story. Um, but to hear the things he was saying that was happening to him and his people, it's just evil. Like it's not it's not like I don't like that policy and Germany is to this See, or South Korea is to that. It's just evil. Yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we live in an environment where so many Westerners want to pretend that there, there is no evil, right? They, they will not right. accept any objective right. uh, uh, frameworks right. of morality. They, they want to pretend all cultures are equally valid. All right. systems are equal. Well, they're not. Right. The Nazis they're not. Were, were bad people who had to be put out of business, right? And, right. and unfortunately, right. it's very hard to tell the difference between them and the, the current Chinese regime. I, I call it national socialism with Chinese characteristics. <laughs> Um, that, yeah, you shouldn't travel to China, Greg. I'm just, I'm just throwing that out. <laughs> yeah, I, I love uh, it though. I mean, Chengdu, what a beautiful city. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I've been on. You can't say you've been everywhere, but I've actually been all over China. So many people, again, they go to Shanghai, right. they go to Beijing. I've been to China. No, I've been to Shanghai, Beijing, Xi'an, Yunnan province, right. uh, up on the border with Tibet. I've been. Uh, uh, oh wow, over Sichuan. Uh, I, it, I've seen a lot of it, and and. Uh, Put in context, put it, put in context for us, what Hong Kong was and what happened. Yeah. Well, so what, 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 what was, I mean, a lot of people know Hong Kong, but like, put that, put the framework around that if you can. Yeah. You know, if you haven't been to Hong Kong in, in the past, back when it was, I think the coolest city in the world, it's, it's hard to appreciate. I remember sitting in an Italian restaurant in Hong Kong, um, with, with a group of international friends uh, from the US, uh, Iran, uh, several other places. Uh, <laughs> and there was a Japanese guy there who was a, a, a singer who did American uh, uh, pop ballads from the 70s. So <laughs> he was there uh, uh, singing like Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald or something. And, it, oh my God. and the owner of the restaurant was Indian. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it was such an amazing uh, cosmopolitan place. I think maybe only like yeah. the James Bond movies from that period gave you a sense of, of how cool Hong Kong was. And uh, the people there were, uh, you know, mostly ethnically Chinese, but again, they were citizens of the world and they were such open thinkers uh, and so 
smart and industrious and uh, had lifted themselves up from from squat with nothing uh, under the uh, the benevolent neglect of the British Empire, right? Because Britain just didn't know what to do with Hong Kong, so they didn't do much, and they just let these people who had nothing but Iraq. Most of them were refugees who fled communist China, uh, you know, in '49, right? Uh, and and ended up there with you know, with nothing. Just work really, really hard. There's no resources there, but they just right. work really, really hard, and they started yeah. making things like plastic flowers and cheap junk. I remember when I was a kid right. in the 60s, it, if it said made in Hong Kong on it, it was crap, right? But by the 1970s, it, 80s, they were suddenly a finance and tech center. And, uh, right. uh, you know, by the time it was given back to China, it was it was the jewel of the Orient, right? And uh, Yeah, it's like the financial capital. I mean, it is a serious, I was there a couple of years ago at this education conference and holy cow, man, the number of high rises, that was a bustling place in 2018. It was amazing. Fortunately, though, it's it's being crushed. And I, I don't think the end will be well, because if you don't allow that that freedom of thinking and expression and connectivity around the world, that you're going to lose the the dynamism that made Hong Kong what it is. And so the Communist Party is, is determined to make it look yeah. exactly like the rest of, of China, which is increasingly going to look like North Korea. Yeah. It, it's it's so tragic and the the scale of the enormity i um i'm actually an omega brand for the omega watch the brand ambassador and i was supposed to go there in 2019 and um they were having the riots and we had to cancel the event uh so it's just it's unfortunate i love the place i love the people and, and I, the, I love the omega. i'm sorry yeah. i'm actually not not wearing it i got it no. <laughs> this morning but yeah i've got one of those too but mine didn't get a space <laughs> this is the bond one it's so cool i i love this one it's like it may be my favorite omega it's super lightweight it's really it's really cool um but anyway yeah so the, the emp device or the yeah i i don't want to put it next to my eye i, I won't spoil the movie but uh you want to keep it away from certain things <laughs> um so so this has happened and you know, every, we've all read 1984. We had to read it in high school. I actually read when I was in Russia training to fly on the Soyuz. I read it again, just kind of for fun. Um, and what you're seeing, like Orwell would be impressed. Orwell would be taking notes and like he probably oh, would have no. written, we would have written 1984 differently because the Chinese have gotten so good at it. Their surveillance state, you know, funny talking about James Bond. And I've, I've been saying this for years, but when you look at the Jason Bourne movies or you, You've got the a drawer full of passports, and that's not possible anymore. You can't go undetected in China because there's a camera everywhere that's going back to the mothership, feeding and facial recognition. Um, you can't travel. You, they they you get a social media score, right? Like if you if you, if you're not tweeting, I love Xi Jinping or whatever, you're not allowed to travel because you get a social media score. I'll, I'll tell you, back in the day, right. Um... I used to go to China and I would go to the internet cafe to use the internet because there wasn't a widely available internet anywhere. Um, and you had to go present a national ID card to, to use a PC because they would then take your national ID card number and type it into a database with that PC number so that the police could track what was done with that PC, right? Right. Uh, back in the day, you just needed that physical card. And if you dropped a, a hundred yuan note, a, you know, a pink Mao on, on the desk, the guy at the at the uh, the desk had a drawer full of national ID cards. I don't know, they were dead people <laughs> or something and he would hand you one and then <laughs> you would type in the number and go use the PC. Can't do that anymore. In fact, no. you probably end up in a very, very bad place if you did yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, it, 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 it's kind of funny, but it, it is a brave new world. And all of these 20th century authors that were envisioning these dystopian futures, you know, the future is now unfortunately, in, in a lot of bad ways. They are exporting that, Terry, right? So that technology that they're developing with American tech companies to do facial recognition and, uh, and track mm -hmm. people, and they've even got an ethnicity identifier. I don't know if you've seen that. And they get concerned if there's too many people of a certain ethnicity in one area, right? And they send in the mm -hmm. police. Uh, they're exporting that technology uh, uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, and that, that should terrify us all. It should. There are a lot of, uh, you know, third world or developing nations go there to learn how to run a surveillance state. And this is not it's not only in China, but they're the they're definitely the best. And it's really bad. This is why getting democracy right. And I talk about this all the time. 
people are probably tired of hearing me say it, but getting democracy right is so important and we're getting it wrong. We're, we're kind of failing. <laughs> we're failing in a lot of ways. We need to up our game to say the least. But um, there's one thing that's out there and, you know, we're so focused on Afghanistan. Um, I had Craig Whit- Whitlock on a few weeks ago who wrote the Afghanistan papers, the Washington Post. That was amazing. Number, uh, He's an amazing guy. Um, but our threat is not Middle Eastern you know, terrorists or whatever, the threat to the world is, is China. And and talk about Taiwan. And first of all, what is Taiwan and what what the risk and threat is there? You know, that's great because a lot of Americans hear about Taiwan. I, I don't think a lot of them can even pick it out on a map. Uh, but yeah. of course, it's a large island off the coast of Asia, uh, south of China um, in the, and to the east. Um, the island was its own, uh, you know, indigenous population and part of what uh, connected to what was called the Rikyo Empire um, that extended from Taiwan in a small chain of islands to Okinawa, south of Japan. And that, that was independent. China had trading relationships with them, but it, not, it was not part of China. Uh, it was colonized by the Dutch in the uh, uh, 16th and 17th century. Uh, hmm. And it was a, a, a Dutch colony. No China was involved. Then there was a, a revolution uh, in, in China and the Ming Empire was expelled by uh, invading Manchurians uh, who formed the, the Qing dynasty, the next dynasty in China, which was not a Chinese dynasty, but a Manchurian occupying dynasty. One of the Ming admirals fled the Chinese mainland and attacked uh, Taiwan and took it away from the Dutch. Uh, but it was never administered from, from the Chinese government in Beijing. It was a, became kind of a colony of a, a fleeing uh, military force from, from China. And so the Chinese influence became important there. Um, the Qing dynasty kind of saw all these Chinese people over there. Well, they sort of belonged to us, but it was, it was very vague and they didn't care about it much. The Japanese wanted it. Um, and the Japanese, after we went over and forcibly opened trade with, with the Japanese in the 19th right. century, rapidly uh, 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 it, uh, embraced our technology and our economic policy called the uh, American economic system of focusing on manufacturing and education, advancing technology. Mm-hmm. And, and they were expanding and became very aggressive. Uh, so they wanted Taiwan they and, 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 and the Chinese sold Taiwan uh, for money to the Japanese in the 19th century, right? And, and the current Chinese administration does not want to admit this. Japanese took it over. Uh, the, not the, the China Oscar sold government. Taiwan to the Japanese. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the, the, like the Russia Japanese gave government. us a lot. Russia sold Alaska to us. They, they did. And the I Taiwanese did not know that. No choice. The indigenous Taiwanese people had no choice. The Japanese I did not really, know that. Wow. Really took the island, paid a token amount to the Dowager Empress uh, who wanted to, to build a big marble boat. In fact, if you've been to the, the the palace there on the, on the lake outside of Beijing. You've probably seen the big, the big marble boat. Yeah, I think yeah. with the Taiwan money. But anyway. I did not know that. Wow. And it was part of, part of Japan from the 19th century until the end of World War II, all right? And if you go to Taiwan now, frankly, the, they liked the Japanese occupation better uh, in some ways than they liked uh, what came later. And they certainly liked it better than the idea of a communist Chinese government. Right. But it was never part of, of, of what's considered modern China, which is something people have to get their heads around. But right. because the Chinese fled there, uh, the current current group claims that they own it. So right. at the end of World War II, um, China is divided between the communist and the nationalist forces under Chiang Kai-shek, uh, right. who are, are, are fighting on the mainland. The U.S. is trying to decide what to do with all these territories that they now kind of nominally hold. They're right. occupying Japan, and and they decide to give Okinawa to Japan and take Taiwan away from Japan and give it to China. Uh, rapidly, uh, the nationalist forces uh, begin to to concede uh, as the uh, the Chinese forces, with help from the Soviet mm-hmm. Union, drive Mao Zedong right. And again, a Chinese military uh, force flees to Taiwan and uh, and takes that over. And so it becomes the Republic of China nationalist uh, China thing, which makes the communists insist that they own it, right? Uh, well, so but it wasn't. It was, but it was Chiang Kai-shek who was fighting against communist China. 
Exactly. So this, the right. communist Chinese never controlled that place and have no, no legitimate political claim over. And most of the people in Taiwan, whether they're indigenous Taiwanese, of Japanese ancestry or of Chinese ancestry, just want to be left alone, right? And yeah. what did they do? They took that island and they embraced the American uh, economic right. system and began focusing on education, on uh, manufacturing, yeah. technology, and exporting. And they, they had double-digit economic growth all in the post-war period from the 1950s. They did exactly what China calls their, their miracle back right. in the 1950s and 60s, right? And right. they became the high-tech hub of, of Asia yeah. with all the semiconductor manufacturing happening there. Mm -hmm. um, Foxconn, the big company that makes all of your, your Apple stuff and right. a lot of other technology stuff from Dell or HP, makes all that stuff. They make it in mainland China now with, uh, with repressed labor and uh, in in right. lackadaisical environmental laws, which is why right. they like to be there, but it's a Taiwanese company, right? Right. Um, so it's a place that has been a friend of the U.S., um, right. both for political expediency back in the 50s and 60s when its government was not really a great, uh, a great government. It was, it was a, a military government, government right? Yeah. But it reformed. It became a democracy uh, successfully in the 80s and 90s. It's, I thought it was kind of a crazy democracy when I saw the members of their parliament yelling and throwing chairs at each other. And stuff. I remember that, yeah. But actually, compared to ours now, it's. it's uh, <laughs> if you live, if you live in a glass house, don't throw stones. Yeah. So anyway, uh, right now, uh, China, just like they're claiming chunks of India, chunks of Vietnam, chunks of Japan, uh, is is claiming all of Taiwan and uh, is getting very absurdive about it. There are thousands of of missiles and, and hundreds and hundreds of airplanes sitting just a few miles across the water uh, aimed at Taiwan. And it is a, a delicate situation. Um, yeah. They've see. been flying, they've been flying uh, bombers and stuff at Taiwan and then they'll turn around at the last minute for weeks now. It's been a really incredibly really aggressive nice. military operations. And what is the last minute? They've clearly entered Taiwan's uh, defensive airspace that Taiwan has clearly said you know, don't come in here, there's going to be a problem. And then, right. uh, given the fact that the, the world did nothing with Hong Kong, Hong Kong yeah. fell, the British who had a signed, uh, uh, you know, legal treaty with China, which China completely violated, uh, yeah. did nothing. Uh, the US did nothing uh, for Hong Kong. Uh, the world is concerned, we'll do nothing for Taiwan. Uh, and, you know, it, at some point you have to draw the line. Uh, we, we failed to right. do that in World War II with the Sudetenland uh, and, and right. it was a great cost. We failed to keep uh, the Japanese out of, of Korea. Uh, and then when they got into China, they did such terrible things. And eventually the U.S. stood up and said, no, you know, after the rape of Shenzhen, you can't do that anymore. We've right. got an embargo on Japanese empire and they attacked us, right? right. So the sooner you draw that line, the better, because it, it, it's never going to yeah. happen. Well, Crimea too. You know, that you fell, that was <laughs> expediently. But, you know, then on the other hand, to I don't know that we need to cost American lives for territories on the other side of the world. So it's a tough, um, yeah. but if you're clear, it's a tough question, you know, if, yeah. if you're clear that you're not going to allow this, I don't think we have a problem. So every Chinese soldier is private, Ryan Cherry. Yeah. Every Chinese soldier is the only son of an only son in a society right. that worships male lineage. They don't want a bunch of body bags going back to China. But China is been lifting itself up, improving everybody's life. If it wasn't for their, their repressive authoritarian government, uh, you know, it would be a great place to live. The last thing they want is, is a war. So I, I think America's uncertainty and big Ambiguity and, and weakness invites invites aggression. If if you were yeah. just clear, we're not going to permit this. I I don't think there'd be a problem. We'd we'd stay in the status quo, but we have to be clear here. Oh, yeah, I I like that. And you just made a really important point that I hadn't thought of. And let's unpack that a little bit. She, his goal, like his grip on power. We think it's absolute, but it's it's tenuous. There's a billion and a half Chinese people, and if they don't, if they get unhappy, it's going to be hard. It'll make he doesn't want that, right? No, in and, his military, okay. His right. military commanders want to be highly respected in the world, uh, right. incredible, and have good technology and, and skills, but they don't want to go fight a, 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 a nasty uh, a ground war invading an island. They really don't. Explain why everybody's private rhyme. That was a really interesting point you made there that was subtle. So because of the one child policy in China and later the two child policy or whatever, but China right. believes they can control your reproductive rights. Right. Um, 
uh, literally yeah. reproductive rights. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the, every family's had one child. Right. And in many cases, they have aborted their female fetuses or abandoned their female children for international adoption or, or you know, uh, whatever happened to them. Uh, in many cases, they would just unfortunately kill female uh, children at birth. Um, right. there, there's a predominance of young men. But in, in the Confucian society, this male lineage is, is very, very important. They, you know, literally have little uh, 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 temples to, to their male ancestors uh, right. in, in their homes. And, and so right. continuing the family name is so important. So if yeah. you've got the only son of an only son uh, and, and he's killed, then you've got, you know, eight grandparents that are, uh, that are, that are kind of upset about that. Um, yeah. And uh, it, it, it won't stand in my opinion. The other thing that's important is no Chinese soldier has any battlefield experience, right? And even right. Their, their commanders basically have none. The last time they did anything with their tanks and machine guns was killing their own students in Tiananmen Square in 1989. Right, right. right. Uh, and, and before- The Korean that, War was a long time ago. Yeah, they invaded uh, Vietnam after we pulled out. Most people don't know that. Right, uh, right, right. And, and right. they killed more people than we did, but they did it in just a few months. Uh, <laughs> Chinese efficiency. Wow. So that I think that the, the risk of Taiwan being invaded is something that I think most Americans, most people around the world, unless you're a policy wonk or, a you know, uh, a news nerd, you're they, they probably don't understand the, the threat that what's happening in Taiwan today. And that that could be obviously a massive that could that could make Afghanistan look like peanuts, you know. Absolutely. And well, on the Afghanistan thing, I, I, I just got to say my piece there that that was an unimaginable tragedy. Uh, yeah. I do not understand why the last administration supposedly uh, made a withdrawal deal. And I have no idea why the, the current administration not only chose to go through with it, but in an absolutely incompetent manner that made America look uh, completely inept and weak on the world stage yeah. and left all those assets. Total disaster. So, um, yeah. But before listen that, to my podcast, listen to the podcast with Craig Whitlock it, or, or read his book. His book is amazing. It was before that, from, from yeah. what I could see, Afghanistan situation looked relatively stable. We would have been there for a very long time if we wanted yeah. to change that society, like two generations. Yeah, uh, but, it, but it could have been done. Uh, but yeah, Taiwan uh, could could blow up in everybody's face and and, and, and literally be uh, uh, be World War Three, uh, and we we need to watch that very closely. We need our A, and this is going getting back to government service. You know, it, government matters, and you need competent government. You need your A team in there, and I, I hope we have that right now. I, and um, we need to figure out how to attract Henry Kissingers and not you know Michael Flynn's in my humble well, opinion. Well, let me be careful with Mr. Kissinger, who. Uh, has been a huge uh, mouthpiece for the Chinese Communist Party since oh really the, the 1980s yeah so I did not um, know that yeah. you know what I'm saying now you know what I'm trying to say I, I, yeah I I do Co competent he's, people he's competent. I'm going to be completely honest uh, he ran a business uh, uh, and uh, on his own and then with Mac McClarty uh, President Clinton's chief of staff and the main business was hooking up American corporations with powers that be in the Chinese Communist Party and exporting American jobs to China. And I did not know that, that. He, ha he has defended their political system publicly. For right. years, uh, I believe he is essentially compromised. Um, and that's a shame. But yeah. yes, we need co we need competent diplomats that think strategically. Not 1970 Kissinger, not 2000 Kissinger. <laughs> yeah, exactly. People pay you millions and millions of dollars for years. Apparently, uh, you uh, you can become less competent. Whatever they want. Yeah, exactly. Well, well, tell tell me about your new book, Greg. Um, so it's a textbook, the new entrepreneurial dynamic. Uh, it's designed for. Uh, master's uh, students and uh, and undergrad programs in entrepreneurship could even be used for AP high school courses. Uh, it takes a, a new perspective, though, uh, that is evolving in, in management schools, which is understanding that the traditional business plan oriented approach, uh, the MBA uh, curriculum is not good for startups because the value that a startup has is not in spending a lot of time on bureaucracy and planning and setting up right. systems and procedures. The power, the competitive advantage of a startup is inherently its dynamism and its right. speed, right? Right. So what you want to do is not lay out a five-year plan and try to execute on it because the environment right. that you live in, particularly today, is going to change. <laughs> the culture, the politics, right. the technology are disruptive. So this right. book is about how do you form a team and, and, and be, create resources um, that will enable you to execute in the 
changing environment you live in and, and, and adapt like a mammal rather than a dinosaur uh, uh, to it. And it's uh, really one of the first textbooks that, that just takes that approach and ejects the business plan and, uh, and the, uh, the sort of old school 1980s uh, thinking around uh, uh, startups. Uh, right. I hope uh, people would enjoy it. It doesn't need to be uh, just in a class. I think it'll be a good read uh, for individuals. I have issued the standard textbook, uh, boring writing. Uh, and, you know, my first publisher uh, that I, I was lined up with was a little disturbed about that. I used the first person often, for instance, mm-hmm. to say I this or I that or relate some of my own entrepreneurial mm-hmm. stories. Um, it's much more readable, like a, a good business uh uh, popular press book and so my new publisher I need it. in san francisco is fantastic and uh, what, what is it called again the new entrepreneurial dynamic okay i'm, I'm, I'm right there. flat world f-l-a-t-w-o-r-l-d and it'll be coming out uh next year you know the world is round though <laughs> I, I i saw it you saw it <laughs> um so I'm, I'm, I'm so glad to hear you say that because I'm working with an energy startup right now. And we did, people are like, do you have a business plan? And I thought about it and I'm like, it just doesn't make sense. And they have these spreadsheets, you know, what's your 10 year revenue going to be? And well, all you do is you take year one and then you add 3% every year, whatever. You just pick a number that's meaningless. Yeah. And so drill them down. Where did those numbers come from? Right. It's all about the assumptions. And so what you just said, I'm so glad to hear because that's exactly was the approach that we're taking. Uh, oh, oh, you got You got to make sure there's cat. You got to make sure there's money in the bank, right? Yeah. You got to make sure you pay your loans if you have debt, because otherwise, the day you don't, you don't own the company anymore. I think, and so, and, and you need the right group of people that are flexible yes. and smart enough to see a problem, willing to admit it's a problem, willing to make a change, right? Uh, and, and 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 capable of executing on it. That's what you and, mean. And people who can do different things, because right right from the beginning, you can't hire you know a whole staff with every, you know, branch that, that, that Ford has, or IBM has, you know, anyway, it, I, I can't wait like to read it. Cuts. Yeah. Yeah. Six of, you, six of you on ISS, somebody has to be able to clean the toilet and do medical, right, Terry? I was the pilot. I cleaned the toilet. I was the medical officer. I was the dentist. Uh, I was the accountant. Cause we had to track all the stuff in on spreadsheets. Um, the scientist, I was the filmmaker i made a, a beautiful planet movie and so yeah it's it's a lot like i think so greg that's a great analogy actually and when um, the ammonia detector goes up somebody's got to do something <laughs> you can't say let's look in the book <laughs> yeah or where's the ammonia guy or where's the emergency <laughs> yeah let the emergency yeah yeah every, you you have to be well the renaissance man if you will so anyway well that sounds great i uh uh i'm looking forward to reading it as a as a business guy so that'll be that'll be cool I will uh, send you some draft copies. Okay. Once again, the program that you have starting up with Thunderbird, uh, real quick plug for that one one last time. Yeah, this is our executive management program in uh, global management uh, with space leadership, policy, and business. It'll be in LA starting in uh, mid-January 2022, completing at the end of the year in 2022. Uh, It's designed for busy professionals. You do not have to quit your day job. In fact, it augments your day job. Amazing networking. Please go to uh, thunderbird.asu.edu and find the degree programs. You'll find the space space program there. It's got a lovely picture taken from ISS. Maybe you took it. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Probably. C- I took a lot. Cygnus capsule being grappled by the uh, the Canada. Very uh, cool. Anyway, um, love to have you all there. Uh, you'll you'll network with the best and the brightest in the space industry. It sounds amazing. Well, thanks for coming on today, Greg. And again, if you like the podcast, subscribe and give us a rating down to earth with Terry Verts.